for the blood this evening? Are you grateful for what Jesus did on the cross? Then can we testify His goodness and the precious blood by singing it with our hearts? Hallelujah! Can somebody say there is nothing like the blood of Jesus? the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus oh, 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 oh. for my pardon this I see nothing but the blood Blood, my precious blood. 
Leave 
Thank you, worship team. Can, can we show, show them, them some love, love and appreciation? Great, Great job. job. You, you can, can all be seated. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. We, we welcome, welcome everyone who is here this evening for our special Good Friday, Friday service. It's, it's such a joy. joy. Some, some people, they cry. Some, some people are dejected. Some, some people mourn. But we celebrate because, because this is not just a memorial service. service. It's the resurrection. It's the celebration. Amen. Because Jesus did not just die, but he was buried and he has risen from the dead. Hallelujah. So welcome you all. Thank you so much for coming this evening. And also we take this time to welcome all our online viewers. Uh, this Sunday is, uh, is going to be marvelous. Look at somebody next to you and say, marvelous. You don't want to miss it. We are going to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you are invited. If you are here in this room, if you are listening, you are invited. And those who are watching online, if you are watching from Dimapur, don't miss it. Come, join us. And, and don't come alone. Get someone with you. Get your family, get your children, get your grandchildren, get your cousins, get your neighbors. It is going to be marvelous. Life-changing experience. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not just a celebration, it is a life-changing experience. So we invite you. And also we will have a wonderful special refreshments after the service. So water baptism will be on April 7th, uh, right after the service. If you want to be water baptized, you can kindly sign up for water baptism after the service. So, uh, and, and if you want to be water baptized, it is mandatory, mandatory for you to be a part of a water baptism class on April 6th at 9.30 a.m., which will be in counselor's room. And Arjunic special will be tomorrow evening at 4. Passion Week concert. And we invite, this is not just for teenagers or young adults, it is for everyone who is young at heart. So we, you are invited. And also, we will not have ushers at the doorway for the offering after the service, but you can always give online. You can simply scan the QR code from the, from the uh, screen, or you will find it in your seat pockets. That's all for the announcements. How many of you are ready for the word? We, we are going to receive something from the Lord. It's not just ordinary, it is extraordinary. Look at your neighbor and say, it's going to be extraordinary. So before pastor comes to the platform, I request you all, kindly rise up and let's greet one another. Let's show our love. All right, praise the Lord. Welcome, 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 welcome. We're so glad to have all of you here tonight on this very, very special Good Friday service. 
Uh, I so appreciate the praise and worship team. It just seems like every service just goes up another notch higher. It just takes us someplace we've never been before. So uh, whether uh, Pastor Lloyd said this or not, I just always want to say it, that I really appreciate all of these fine folks. Amen. And I appreciate all of those who are serving in this church and helps ministry. Uh, you may not be under the bright lights, but know that heaven has its eyes on you. Hallelujah. <laughs> We appreciate and love all of these wonderful students. Don't they add such vibrancy and life and zeal? And see, see, we, we seated them in the middle knowing that the fire spreads. Even to the far corners, even upstairs. Hallelujah. We're so blessed the, about, we're so thankful and blessed for all the wonderful gifts that God has given us. And once again, we do want to acknowledge our dear friends, men of God, Pastor Michael Varghese and also uh, Pastor Raj Kiran. And what a tremendous blessing they are to all of us. And they have just blessed the socks off the students. They have to go to the store and buy new socks because they're just so blessed. And so, I mean, one more time, just look their way and give a big hallelujah <laughs> for them. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And tonight is a very special night, and I want to share with you the message God has placed on my heart. And I've never preached this exactly before, and this may not exactly be the message that you would anticipate, but I do feel led of the Lord to go this direction. And I do want to just give you this disclaimer. This will be slightly longer than your normal situation, so maybe if you can just kind of pace yourself, lean back and get comfortable, and, and, and if you are transported up into thir the third heaven, we'll wait for you to come back down, and, <laughs> and, uh, and I'll try to, to go quickly, being mindful of the time. Praise the Lord. I want to begin by reading from the book of Mark, chapter 14, and verse 1. And if you can find that opening for me, We'll read in just a second, but first, let's just take a moment to pray together. Father, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, and we ask you to bless your people. We know that you are always with us, and you will never leave us. You will never abandon us. We come boldly tonight because of the blood, having confidence in the wonder-working, washing, the atoning blood of Christ. We ask you today, Father, to fill our hearts with truth. Give us new insight and understanding and help us to deliver your word faithfully, accurately, punctuated with power under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, someone shout amen. amen. All right, thank you. Notice with me Mark chapter 14 and verse 1. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. I want to give you some background tonight so that you can better appreciate what's going on. The law of Moses actually made no provision for chief priests, plural, only an individual high priest, singular. But after the Jews returned from captivity, the office of high priest became more of a political position instead of a strictly religious one. And several Jewish families who were related to Aaron vied or con contended for that position. Some even paid bribes to get it. By the time of Herod the Great, the high priest, besides overseeing the temple and presiding over the Sanhedrin, that's the Jewish council or assembly, he more or less became a liaison, a, a go-between, an intermediary between the Jewish people and the Roman government. And this caused the high priest to be both revered because of his position, but also detested by the people. And Joseph ben Caiaphas was appointed high priest in the year A.D. 18 by the Romans, by the Roman procurator Valerius Gratus. Caiaphas actually replaced his father-in-law, Annas, 
who was the previous high priest but was deposed by the same gratis, even though the high priest is supposed to serve a, for a lifelong appointment. And so Annas and Caiaphas, his son-in-law, and several of Annas's other sons who also individually served as high priests over a period of time, they came together, they coalesced to form this like ruling elite family in Israel. And they held considerable political power. That's what Mark means when he talks about the chief priests. And tonight, I want to examine especially, I want to focus on the arrest and the trial of Jesus of Nazareth. But it would be helpful for us, and I know this is a little academic, I, I, I trust you'll bear with me just for a few moments, but it would be helpful for us to have a better understanding of Jewish history, especially what we call the intertestimonial period from Malachi to Matthew, you see. Because the people that we read about at the end of the Old Testament seem to be different than the people that we read about in the Gospels because a lot happened during that time. In 597 BC, the people of Judah were taken captive by the Babylonians who were themselves overthrown by the Persians. Under Cyrus the Great, the Jews were permitted to go back to their homeland and rebuild the temple. After the Persians came the Greeks, led by Alexander the Great. The Maccabean Revolt in 160 BC, 160 BC chased away the Greeks. And the descendants of Judas Maccabeus ruled over Israel for a hundred years in what is commonly called the Has Hasmonean dynasty. When fighting erupted between rival factions in this family, the Roman general, Pompey, was asked to settle the dispute. Pompey seized this opportunity to bring Judea or Israel into the Roman Republic in 63 BC. Real quickly, just so you understand who these people are. At the same time, there arose a man from Idumea. He was basically a descendant of Esau. He was not Jewish, but through a forced conversion, he claimed to be uh, following Judaism. This man was named Antipater, and he won the favor of Julius Caesar by sending an army from Judea to help, over, to help defeat Caesar's arch enemy, Pompey. As a result of this, Julius Caesar named Antipater as procurator of all Judea, or the governor or ruler of all Judea. Antipater, in turn, named his son Herod as procurator of Galilee, the northern region of Israel. Antipater was not very popular, and he was murdered in the year 43 BC. And the Hasmonean dynasty, the previous people, rose up and they chased away the Romans, which is rather quite amazing. But Herod, the son of Antipater, managed to escape, and he went back to Rome. He had several powerful friends in Rome, most notably Mark Anthony. You may have heard that name before. And on the floor of the Senate, Herod was proclaimed king of the Jews. And Herod was given a legion or several legions of Roman soldiers, and he went back to Israel and retook and reconquered all of that land. He is known throughout history as Herod the Great. But he was a ruthless, horrible monster of a man. He did not hesitate to eliminate anyone who got in his way or any political rival. He even killed his own sons, three of his own sons and his wife, not to mention hundreds of Jews. And the Jewish people, not surprisingly, despised Herod. So Herod, again, forgive me just for a moment. So Herod, to show some benevolence, 
He invested in large construction projects throughout Israel. He established the city of Caesarea. You remember, maybe remember reading that in the Bible. Caesarea was a Roman city named after his best friend, Julius Caesar. It included a stadium, a hippodrome, things like that, a port. Um, he constructed several large fortresses. And then most important of all, Herod completely renovated the temple in Jerusalem. And in the classical period, like from the Greeks through the Romans, the temple in Jerusalem, Herod's temple, was the most impressive and largest religious structure in the world. So it's quite, quite an accomplishment. After Herod died, in his written will, he decreed that his kingdom was to be split among three of his sons. But Julius Caesar, I'm sorry, but Augustus Caesar, rather, decreed that his sons would be called tetrarchs, not kings, and that his sons would be subject to the Jewish Sanhedrin. And also, if any of his sons died or they were removed from office, then that province would come directly under Roman rule. Herod's son Archelaus was made tetrarch of Judea. But there was tumultuous fighting in Jerusalem. You may recall that's why Mary and Joseph, coming out of Egypt, did not go into Judea, but into Galilee. And Archelaus, the son of Herod, was removed by Augustus and exiled to Gaul, like modern-day France, where he spent the rest of his life. And so Rome sent a prefect or procurator directly to the province of Judea, and it was directly ruled by Rome. We mentioned Valerius Gratus, the, the governor who appointed Caiaphas. He was actually, this man was actually replaced in the year 26 AD by another man, Pontius Pilate. And it was uh, Herod's other son, Antipater, uh, sorry, Antipas, sorry, Antipas was made tetrarch of Galilee. And it was in Galilee that Jesus of Nazareth began his public ministry in the year 29 AD. So the chief priests, the religious rulers of Judea, they felt threatened by Jesus' ministry. They said in John chapter 11, verse 48, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation, which ironically is exactly what happened because they did arrest Jesus. Now, the scripture we read to begin with, Mark 14, verse 1, says that the chief priests were seeking how to arrest him by stealth. The Greek word here is dolos, and it means to bait, to prepare a trap, to use trickery and deceit. The God's Word translation says they were looking for some underhanded way to arrest Jesus. The chief priest realized they could not apprehend Jesus in public because they feared an uproar from the crowds. It could result in a violent revolt, especially during Passover. But their dilemma was solved by one of Jesus' closest followers, Judas Iscariot, who agreed to lead them directly to Jesus, away from the prying eyes and the curious eyes of the multitudes, all for a very reasonable sum, of course. In John chapter 18, verse 3, we read, So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. It's rather interesting. The Greek word band, band of soldiers, it's the word spira, spira. It, this word is borrowed from Latin. Latin was the language of the Roman Empire. 
And it refers to a Roman cohort, which is uh, a number of soldiers. It's a tenth of a legion. Probably it was about 480 soldiers. I think in our minds we figure that, that Judas had like maybe 10, 12 people. No, there was probably hundreds of soldiers that went with him. In John chapter 18, verse 4, we read that Jesus approached the mob and said, whom do you seek? It's interesting, he didn't try to hide from them. And they responded, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he answered them, I am he. But in the Greek language, he literally said, I am. I am. Which reminds us in the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verse 14, when Moses was on the mountain, he said, he said to the Lord, tell me your name. And God said, I am who I am. You cannot compare me to some other god or some god of the Egyptians or the other nations. So you tell the Israelites, I am has sent you. He said, I am. Verse 6 tells us, when Jesus said this, this crowd drew back and fell to the ground. They didn't trip over something. They weren't pushed by the disciples. The power of God hit them. All 480 of them. Whew. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But even then, Jesus did not run away. He stood his ground. He faced his adversaries. And he willingly surrendered to them. He had said earlier in John chapter 10, verse 18, No man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. But at that moment, there was a scuffle. Peter took a knife and sliced off the right ear of the high priest's servant. But Jesus ordered his disciples to cease. He said, no more of this. And Luke 22, verse 51 says, and he touched his ear and healed him. Think about this. Even after they had experienced the power of God and witnessed an astounding miracle, these hard-hearted men still proceeded to arrest Jesus. I mean, if I was in the crowd and suddenly he says, I am, and boom, we all hit the ground, and then we see him take some guy's ear and put it back on and it's all healed, I would have said, hey, um, I don't know, but I think maybe this is not a good idea. I think we might need to go back home and think this one over, guys, but they went right ahead. Hmm. So they took Jesus to be questioned by the Sanhedrin. The trial before the Sanhedrin violated several Jewish laws. For example, Exodus 23 verse 8 says that no trial could be conducted as a result of bribery. But they paid Judas to lead them to Jesus. Also, no, under Jewish law, no criminal proceedings could occur after sunset and in a private place. Yet these interrogations happened in the residence of the high priest and in the dead of night. Also, no trials were to be held on a feast day or on the eve of a Sabbath, which is exactly when this trial occurred. Deuteronomy 19.15 says, only on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a charge be established. Various witnesses were brought forth, but Mark chapter 14 verse 56 tells us, but their testimony did not agree. Also, according to Jewish law and Jewish statutes, I hope you understand what I'm saying, judges or members of the Sanhedrin, that's the Jewish assembly, legislative assembly, council, members of the Sanhedrin or judges were not permitted to actively participate in the trial. 
This was to ensure impartiality. But in Matthew 26, verse 63, we read, the high priest interjected himself into the proceedings and straightly charged Jesus, asked Jesus, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus responded in verse 64, you have said so. That's an affirmative answer. The easy to read translation says, yes, that's right. You know, I've heard some people, even like online, uh, erroneously assert that Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. But we see here, he most definitely did. And the Jewish rulers did not condemn Jesus because he claimed to be a prophet or because he claimed to be a teacher. It's because he claimed to be God's only unique son. Then Jesus continued to say in verse 64, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. In other words, he said to those men, very soon the tables will be turned and you will be the defendant and I will be the judge. Whew. The high priest, hearing this, rent his clothes. He, he tore his garments. Why? That was an ancient Jewish expression of extreme grief or anguish. He did that to be dramatic. And he said, that's blasphemy. But Leviticus chapter 21 verse 10 forbade the high priest from tearing his priestly garments in this way. It was illegal to do that. Also, Jewish law did not permit the accused to testify against himself. And a person could not be condemned solely on the basis of his own words. There had to be corroborating witnesses. In Matthew 26, verse 66, the high priest then asked the whole council, what is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. But Jewish law required that voting for capital punishment be done individually, turn by turn, not collectively, beginning with the youngest. And this was to ensure that the younger members of the council would not be unduly influenced by the older ones. Also, you could not condemn a person to death by a unanimous decision. There had to be some dissenting votes that say, no, he's innocent. You see, this was to prevent a plot, a scheme to unjustly remove someone, which is exactly what was happening here. Furthermore, the sentence could only be pronounced, according to Jewish law, the sentence could only be pronounced three days after the verdict. And a person condemned to die was not to be beaten or scourged before his execution. But Matthew 26, 67 says, then they spit in his face and struck him and some slapped him. And then they took Jesus to Pilate. John 18, 28 says at sunrise, they brought Jesus to the praetorium. That was Pilate's official residence. We read, they themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. I guess it never occurred to them that condemning an innocent man to die is infinitely more defiling than walking into a building. You know, religion really blinds people, doesn't it? In verse 29, Pilate asked the chief priests, the rulers, what accusation do you bring against this man? And this perhaps suggests, suggests that Pilate had some knowledge of who Jesus was, and he was demanding, you must bring me an official accusation. 
levy a legal charge. In Matthew 27, 18, it says, for he, Pilate, knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Envy is a terrible thing. Envy is when you feel bad or hate someone because they're blessed. Do you know that a lot of criticism in the body of Christ is not based on theology, it's based on jealousy? Come on, I see people online talking about, you know, how bad mega churches are. I, I guarantee you the people making that criticism don't have mega churches. You hear some Christians criticizing those who are prosperous. I don't think men of God should drive a Mercedes. They believe that until God gives them a Mercedes, and then they change their doctrine. Isn't that funny how that works? I don't believe a man of God should have an airplane. But if God gave you an airplane, that would be just fine. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, okay. <laughs> The Jewish leaders answered in verse 30, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. That's not a very convincing response. They evidently expected Pilate to go ahead and carry out the sentence without questioning the process that we took to come to this verdict. But Pilate would have none of it. Pilate replied in verse 31, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own laws. See, he realized that no real crime has been committed here. Pilate is not, you know, he's not a deacon in a Baptist church. He, he's, he's not an elder in a Presbyterian church. He's not a Sunday school teacher at your local Pentecostal church. He's a heathen with a capital H. But even some sinners can see through a fraud and a sham like this. He realized these people are not interested in a fair trial. This is a kangaroo court. Amen. The Jews said to Pilate, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Now, under the law of Moses, capital punishment definitely was provided for. But what, he, what they meant was, after coming under Roman rule, they were not permitted to execute anyone. Only the Romans could do that. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. However, they had no qualms later on stoning Stephen to death, but let's come to that point some other time. Verse 32 says this. This is still John 18, 32. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. The Jews historically stoned a man to death. Crucifixion, however, was uniquely a Roman method of execution. By the way, why did they want Jesus crucified? Why not stone him to death? Why not some other way? There are easier ways to die than crucifixion. It wasn't just to put you to death. It was to degrade you publicly, to shame you openly, to, 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 to just to, to ridicule you, to show the world you are nothing. You are nothing. That's why they wanted this method. In Luke 23, verse 3, Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him in verse 3, you have said so. Another affirmative answer. God's word translation says, yes, I am. And Pilate evidently understood that this was a religious, or I should say a spiritual title that he was referring to, and not a political title. In fact, Jesus himself said in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. Maybe we need to stop and think about that ourselves for just a moment. Some people are so busy building their own kingdom, they're not interested in God's kingdom. Hmm? Amen. I remember years ago, you'll forgive me for meddling in your affairs, but I remember many years ago, I heard one tremendous man of God said, some men build their ministries. 
Other men build the kingdom. And if you will build the kingdom, God will build your ministry. Can I get an amen? amen? Then Pilate announced to them, I find no guilt with him. And the chief priest said, He has been stirring up the people, beginning at Galilee. And when Pilate heard he's from Galilee, he decided to send him, guess who, to Herod, who just so happened to be in town that day. Why? It's Passover. Just like in, on Republic Day, you know, where does everybody, where does every hot shot want to be? In Delhi. That's where the action is. Well, where does everybody want to be during Passover, you know, in the first century A.D.? In Jerusalem, that's where the action is happening, you see. But Pilate had already determined that Jesus was innocent. I find no guilt with him. So why send him to Herod? That's not necessary. Because like so many people, he wanted to pass the buck. Let somebody else deal with this. Let's, let somebody else take care of it. I don't, I don't want to mess with it. Herod was glad to meet Jesus because he wanted to see a miracle. But he was like so many people that we know of who are not really hungry for God. They want to be entertained. And Herod asked Jesus many questions, one after another. And it's interesting, the Bible says in Luke 23, verse 9, that Jesus made no answer. He didn't even say one word to Herod. Jesus said, I only speak the words that I hear from my Father. You can tell that God the Father had such little regard for Herod that he had nothing to say to him at all. Jesus had more to say to the woman at the well of Samaria than he did this guy. Amen. So Herod sent Jesus back to Pilate. And curiously, the Bible says in Luke 23, verse 12, that Pilate and Herod used to be bitter rivals and enemies. Like some people we know, but I don't see them right now. They were bitter, bitter rivals and envies, enemies, but that day they became good friends. How strange. What a strange solidarity evil men have when they come together to resist the work of God. Would that we had that kind of solidarity in the body of Christ. Pilate then told the chief priests, I've examined him, and I found no fault with him, and neither did Herod. That's why he sent him back to us. Then he said, Pilate said in Luke 23, verse 16, I will therefore punish and release him. Well, if you find no fault with him, if Herod found no fault with him, then why would you need to punish him? Beware of the spirit of compromise. That's what Pilate's trying to do. Maybe I can please these people and, and, and kind of, you know, maybe sort of find some place in the middle. Beware of the spirit of compromise. But they cried out, no, put him to death. For Pilate, this must have been such an atypical, unusual situation. Usually, the religious leaders are asking for leniency for a fellow Jew, not a harsh condemnation. But then Pilate remembered. They had a tradition to show some goodwill to the people, during Passover, they would release one prisoner, just to have good relations with the public. So Pilate offered two options. Barabbas, who was a notorious, infamous criminal and a murderer, or Jesus, King of the Jews. It should be obvious which one deserved to be released. And they cried out, 
give us Barabbas. So the guilty man was released, and the innocent man was condemned. Friend, you and I, we are Barabbas. We are Barabbas. I've often wondered how Barabbas must have thought. They brought him out of jail. They brought him out of prison. He's killed people. He's tried to lead revolt. And suddenly the guard knocks on his cell. Get out. Come on. You're going to stand here. Why? Just shut up and come. They push him out. And he stands there probably surly, cocky, arrogant, murder in his heart. And he realizes, I might get out today. Whom up against? Him? Go ahead and lead me back to my cell. There's no chance. This, him? Well, we all know who the winner is, not me. And they said, Brabish, you're free. What thoughts must have gone through his mind as he walked out of that place thinking, how can I be free? And how can this man take my place? Hallelujah. In John chapter 19, verse 1, we read that Pilate had Jesus flogged. The whip that was employed by the Romans had little pieces of metal or bone attached to the end of these leather straps or strips. And these cut a deep gorge into the flesh of the victim. It was a horrible ordeal. Now, the Jews had a law that a man cannot receive more than 40 lashes. In fact, actually, when they counted, they stopped at 39, just in case they miscounted. That's why the Apostle Paul said later that twice or thrice I've received 40 lashes minus one. But the Romans had no law like this, and they beat a man within an inch of his life. Then in verse 4, John 19, verse 4, Pilate said to the crowd, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Well, if he's innocent, why did you scourge him? But this suffering was not incidental. I guess in a strange way we could almost thank Pilate because this suffering was part of our redemption. The Bible predicted hundreds of years before through the mouth of Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 53 and verse 5, and by his stripes we are healed. The chief priests cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said, why? Why? What has he done wrong? They answered, because he has made himself the son of God. John 19 verse 8 says, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. Usually in a trial, it's the defendant that's afraid, not the judge. In fact, it's so interesting. Matthew tells us in Matthew 27, verse 19, that Pilate's own wife, you know, some men, if they would just listen to their wives. I heard that amen. <laughs> I said some men, not all men. Some men... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing. Some men, if they would just listen to their wives, his wife sent him words saying, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Mrs. Pilate also wasn't a pastor or an evangelist or a missionary or a tongue-talking Holy Ghost woman. She's, she's just, you know, your basic heathen too, but God could even speak to her. In John chapter 19, verse 12, we read, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. 
yeah, you are the official representative of imperial Roman power. You are the voice of Caesar in the land. You don't need to seek to release him. You can just do it. You, you've got thousands of soldiers behind you, bloodthirsty killers. They'll gladly march the man right out of the place if you say so. What's going on here? Pilate further questioned Jesus, but Jesus was silent because there's no need to answer any more questions. We all know what's happening here. Isaiah 53 verse 7 says, Like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Pilate must have thought, I've, I, I, have, I have tried all kinds of people in the time that I've been here, all kinds of criminals and robbers and agitators, and they all argue vehemently of their innocence, and, and, and sometimes they curse and, and swear. And this man is completely silent. Pilate cried out. I'm sure he was confused at this point. He was deeply troubled. Shall I crucify your king? And the people uttered these terrible words. In verse 15, we have no king but Caesar. It wasn't just Judas who betrayed the Lord that day. I'm sorry, the whole nation rejected their God. Forty years later, the very thing the chief priests feared happened. The Romans ransacked Jerusalem. They completely destroyed the temple. Jesus predicted not one stone will be left upon another. That's what happened. The Jews were scattered all over the nations, and, and until 1948, there was no Jewish nation at all. Pilate then washed his hands before them, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. Pilate knew that he was partner to a terrible travesty of judgment, and he's trying to absolve himself. I'm innocent. I don't have anything to do with this. That's a lie, and you know it. I'm innocent. I wash my hands of this. And in Matthew 27, 25, they answered him, His blood be on us and on our children. I hope you don't misinterpret this message in any way. I have such a great love in my heart for the Jewish people. And, I'm, and like the Apostle Paul said, you know, I wish that they would receive Christ more than anything. But I also have to say something to you. You wonder sometimes why the Jewish people have suffered over the years so horribly and terribly. That's it. That's it right there. And they led Jesus away to be crucified. He was treated so unjustly so that you and I could be justified. In closing, two things Pilate said. In John 19, verse 5, he said, Behold the man. And I believe that's what we should do tonight. Take a long, hard look at this man, Jesus of Nazareth. See him for who he truly is. If you could peel away the layers of maybe religious traditions and, and church culture and see 
not a holiday, not a tradition, a ritual, but this one, Jesus Christ. See him for who he truly is. And then in verse 14, Pilate said, Behold your king. He's not merely a figure from ancient history. He is Lord today. And the scripture says if we confess him, acknowledge him, make him Lord of our lives, and believe in him, knowing that he died as our substitute, he took our place on the cross, we will be saved. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, I would ask you just a moment to contemplate your own life and your own heart today. I can think of nothing more important at this moment than to make sure you know this man, Jesus, the Son of God, the only Savior of the world. I don't know who you are and I don't know where you came from, but I know where you're going. Without Christ, I'm sorry to say there is no hope for any of us. For we have all failed and come short. We've broken God's laws, and we deserve the punishments, eternal, eternal punishment of hell. But with Christ, heaven is our home, and God is our Father, and we are clean, and we are forgiven. The greatest thing that ever happened to me was when I simply asked Jesus to be the Lord of my life. As many years ago, you'd think that something that happened so long ago would be hazy and a little bit unclear to me, but I can remember it as if it was yesterday. Because on that day, the old John Routon died, and a new John Routon was born. And I have no regrets, and I never will. I'm not saying that because I'm a pastor. I'm saying that because I'm a Christian. In an attitude of prayer, I would like to ask you just to contemplate your situation, and I would like to, where you are seated, pray for you at this Easter season, this resurrection season, to pray for your salvation. If you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, or you're not sure where you stand with the Lord, and I'd like to pray for you if you've fallen away from him. And like the prodigal son, you'd like to come back to have your fellowship renewed. I'd like to pray for you. So I'd like to ask you to do one very simple thing, simple but serious. If that's you, and you would say, please include me in this prayer of salvation or rededication, then do this one thing for me, please. This is no one's business but you and God. If you'll lift your hand in the air, I'll know to include you in this prayer. And I believe heaven will know that you mean business tonight. Yes, I see that hand. Go ahead and lift your hand and I'll know to include you in this prayer. That's all I'm gonna ask you to do tonight. So look around this room. Yes, I see those hands up there. Yes, I see that hand as well. I see another hand. Yes, I see a hand in the back. There's another one, young one. I see over there on the side. Yes, I, I see some, yes, some more hands up there in the balcony. Yes, some more hands as well. What, what could be more important than this? Let me tell you something. Long after the food is eaten, long after the clothes are worn, long after we drive the wheels off our vehicles and our houses are dilapidated, this one thing remains. Not just life, eternal life, everlasting life. I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer, but I want you to sincerely make this your prayer. Don't just imitate me. Don't just echo my words, but from the heart. Make this your prayer to God. I'd like to ask the church to join in, to lend to them some moral support and encouragement. So out loud, with your own voice and from your heart, pray with me. Dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
and that he died on the cross for my sins. His blood was poured out to wash me clean, but you raised him from the dead, and he is alive, and he is Lord. I receive him as my Savior. I confess him as my Lord. Jesus, come into my heart. Wash me clean. Give me eternal life. And by your Spirit, live in me. Thank you, Father, for hearing my prayer. Thank you for receiving me, restoring me. Thank you, Father. I am yours and you are mine. And I belong in your family, O oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Can you lift up your hands right now and just praise the Lord in this place today? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to allow in music my sermon to be completed so you'll hear the rest of the story from them. You can turn the lights out.
three days went by again they came to move the stone to bless the slain with oil and spice anointing hallelujah Hallelujah. We're going to receive communion tonight, and I trust that you received the elements in the foyer before you entered the hallway, the sanctuary. But if you're here tonight, and for whatever reason you didn't get uh, the elements, uh, the little plastic cup with the wafer on top, if you can simply, I know it's a little bit dark now, but if you can simply lift up your hand, the ushers have a few extra and we can get one to you. Anyone here on the floor in the balcony, if you did not receive the communion elements, please let us know, we'll get one to you. I want to let you know that in our church, we practice open communion, and what that simply means is, if you know Jesus, then you are most welcome to partake, to join in with us in this communion service. Um, Parents, if you have young ones with you, I will leave that up to you, whether they're old enough and they understand what's going on here um, this evening. I want to read to you from the book of 1 Corinthians and chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the wafer. This is a symbol. It represents Christ's body, which was broken for us. And the reason we eat it is because it's not enough to know that Jesus died for our sins. We must receive him as our Savior. We do this as an act of faith to show that we have received him. We have taken him into ourselves. And because his body was broken for us, we are restored to God. And with his stripes, we are healed. Would you hold the wafer up, the bread up? Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. 
He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. And with his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. And because we partake of this one bread, symbolically we are showing that we also have received Jesus, the bread of life, and we also are one bread, one body in him. We thank you for the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we take together? It's the blood. It's the blood that gives us access into the holy places. It's the blood that gives us victory to overcome the accuser of the brethren. God told the Israelites, and when I see the blood, I will not allow the destroyer to touch you. It's the blood that protects us. It's the blood that gives us a standing with the Father. It's a blood covenant because of the blood. The Apostle Paul refers to this as the cup of blessing because every blessing that heaven has to give is symbolized by what's in this cup. It's all because of the blood. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus again and we thank you for this crimson love that flowed from the veins of Emmanuel to wash us clean. You have purchased us with blood and we are not our own. So we will glorify you with our body and with our spirit, which belong to you. And it's the blood, the blood that speaks a better word than that of Abel crying out for mercy. It's the blood. It's the blood that gives us boldness. Boldness to come into the holy places, to stand before you. Our faith is in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we drink together because we remember and we will never forget the sacrifice of your Son for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink together, shall we? Thank God, thank God, thank God. I believe tonight we ought to stand to our feet and just worship the Lord for a moment here in this place. Are there any willing hearts here tonight? Are there any earnest souls here tonight? Hallelujah. Come on, can, is there someone that can praise God with me tonight? I believe we got a reason to be glad tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.
Let it thunder. Let it roar. Sing to the Lord your own song tonight. He'll give the harmony. He'll give the melody. He'll give the word. For he is worthy. Sing it, people. Hallelujah. 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 Lift your voice. Is anybody happy in the house today? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. What a wonderful night. I'm going to ask the ushers to turn the house lights up for just a moment. Turn the house lights up. I want you to grab the hand of the person to your left or your right. I like to do this often because I'd like us to pray for those next to us. If you're not at liberty to reach over and grab your stranger's hand, you can at least maybe direct your faith in that direction. But you know, we're not just individuals. We are members of Christ's body. If one member suffers, we all suffer. And if one member is honored, we are all rejoicing. Hallelujah. Jesus didn't just die for you. He died for the person whose hand you hold right now. So let's just pray that God would bless that person. I know he has. Let's just pray that God would give more favor and strength and direction, not only to him or her, but to their families as well. Come on, church. Let's lift our voices. We're going to pray together in mass, everybody. Father, we are blessed with every blessing that heaven has to give in Christ Jesus today. You have ransomed us. You have delivered us. You have freed us from the bonds of slavery to sin. Hallelujah. And now we are your new creations. Hallelujah. Created for good works, which God preordained that we should walk in them. And we give you glory and we give you honor. And with everything within us, we cry, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. In the name of Jesus, 
Amen. Amen. Don't forget, tomorrow night, the Argenix is having a wonderful passion concert. And Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday. Please join us. Better than that, bring somebody with us. It'll be a wonderful time. So glad all of you are with us tonight. Drive home safely. God bless you, everybody. We'll see you next time.